Hey friends, this is Pastor Fieber Corn here with you for another rendition of Women's Bible Study as we look at these Old Testament figures. Uh, today we're looking at the prophet Elisha, which I can only think means your previous lesson was on the prophet Elijah, J-A-H, as opposed to S-H-A, Elijah and Elisha. Hey, I've been a pastor for 10 years, I've been studying the Bible longer than that, and I still don't often uh, keep these two straight and distinguish between them. Uh, it's kind of like identical twins. Uh, our friends, the Oswalds, have uh, Adam and Alex. I've known them since they were little boys. Uh, I can finally distinguish between them, usually, and get it right, but I can't keep track the characteristics of each of them um, because they look alike and their names are alike. Well, Elijah and Elijah are even more remote to me than uh, some family friends I've known my whole life, and so... Uh, I have a difficult time distinguishing between them. But uh, without further ado, we're going to get into Elijah's life and ministry and see if we can explore a few things about that that might supplement uh, what you've already been studying uh, in your uh, workbook. So um, I know my face is probably blocking out the top right there, but what you see here on the right is a chart of uh, the various kings and prophets of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, I cut out, uh, for the sake of space, on the right-hand side, the prophets to Judah, but that's because we're talking about Elisha, who was a prophet to the northern kingdom. And so if you see there in that left-hand column, uh, Israel's kings, and when they reigned, you'll see Elijah and Elisha on the far left, uh, and the various kings to whom they prophesied. And I have a little red box around Elijah's reign. And um, what you'll notice there, uh, you read the words on the left, Elijah served as a prophet for nearly five decades. That's a long time to be in ministry. I can tell you that right now. Uh, I 100% predict I will not make five decades in ministry. I will die before that and hopefully retire before that. So uh, the burden that this man carried uh, as he prophesied to kings and in the midst of God's people should not be underestimated. The end of the Omri dynasty uh, concluded in about 850. You see Omri up there in about 885. He reigned for 12 years. And then uh, it's his dynasty because they're his children. Um, uh, the Jehu dynasty begins when Jehoash is on the throne in around 800. Um, so that's that's kind of the timeline in which Elijah prophesied. So then we can go back and look at the list of kings and figure out uh, who was king when Elijah prophesied. But I, I think the important thing to know is the context in which he ministered. Uh, there was a lull in Assyrian power, so one of Israel's main threats was waning. Uh, but that provided an opportunity for Aramean expansion. So uh, one enemy is on the downfall, but another enemy is on the rise. Uh, Israel... Uh, as has been true throughout history, gets no rest. During this time, Judah seems to have acted as something as a vassal to Israel. Yes, they were separate kingdoms, but the power and strength was with the northern kingdom Israel right now. Um, especially, we see this during the, during the war with Moab. Um, Je Jehoshaphat readily serves as Jehoram's ally during that time. So, um, yeah, that probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you as you're studying this, but just sort of sets the table of the context of what's going on uh, in the time uh, that Elijah speaks to kings and people. Elijah and Elisha have very similar ministries. Uh, it's very clear that when uh, the author of Kings narrates these events, he tries to show us um, similarities between them. Um, so you can see uh, both of them pronounce natural disasters, uh, are fed miraculously, care for widows, raise the dead, and execute God's judgment. Uh, both of them prophesy for rain, predict the death of a ruler, uh, pass through the Jordan River, and have mysterious uh, ends of their lives. Uh, Elijah, of course, famously goes to heaven in a whirlwind and a chariot of horses and fire appear. Uh, Elisha dies and is buried, and a dead man's body comes to life after touching his bones. So uh, two characters in, in Scripture that 
ask to be read uh, together similarly, uh, many similar life events. And that's just to say that Elijah carries the same authority that Elijah did. Um, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when we see Jesus, we see Moses and Elijah, not Moses and Elisha. But that's not to diminish the importance of Elijah and the things uh, he does uh, in his ministry. Now, as far as Elisha's relationship with kings, um, he's kind of a a middle figure. Um, former prophets were primarily associated with the kings and um, prophesying to them, uh, calling them to repentance, like Nathan and David, for instance. Uh, later, classical prophets would focus um, on other national leaders or society at large, kind of calling the whole nation to repentance, as you see with, uh, for instance, Isaiah, um, some of the other prophets on down the line, Jonah, Amos. Um, so Elijah does both, though. He he prophesies to kings and uh, amidst the people, and so he's kind of a, a middle figure there. Elijah is slightly more supportive of Israelite kings than Elijah was. Uh, he seems a little more friendly to them, although that may be due to his particular personality, uh, which we'll talk about more at the end. Um, but the the support Elijah gives the kings is mainly for the sake of the Israelite people, not for the institution of the kingship as such. It's like Elisha knows, hey, having a stable king over us to rule us it can can be good for the people if the king is not corrupt and so i'll support the uh the institution of the kingship for that sake if for if for nothing else uh, i just want to show you this this is kind of interesting uh peter and paul and acts have very similar ministries of course peter was one of the 12 um a very prominent disciple we know probably more about peter than any of the other disciples based on uh, how often he opens his mouth in the narrative and He's occasionally right, but mostly wrong. Uh, but then after the resurrection of Jesus and after Pentecost, Peter takes bold uh, leadership action in the church. Well, then along comes Paul. And uh, Paul, as Paul says, I'm one untimely born. I mean, he was a persecutor of the church uh, before Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And so you can understand why some people might um, say, I follow Peter and not Paul, because Peter was there the entire time. And Paul's kind of a latecomer and has a sketchy past. Well, uh, the writer of Acts, Luke, is sure to show us that they too have similar ministries, just like Elijah and Elijah are both to be seen as carrying the authority of God, so too Peter and Paul. Uh, uh, both of them heal a man who's lame from birth. Uh, you remember Peter heals people by his shadow. Uh, Paul heals people by handkerchiefs and aprons. Uh, the Jews are jealous of both of their ministries. Uh, they both confront sorcerers. They both lay hands on uh, people and give the Holy Spirit. And I love this one here. Uh, Peter raises Tabitha or Dorcas from the dead. And do you remember that story about Eutychus? He's listening to Paul sleep and he's sitting in the window. And apparently Paul's droning on and he gets bored, falls asleep, falls out the window and dies. And then uh, Paul goes down and revives him. And you think, well, why in the heck is that story even in scripture? So, uh, so random. Well, that was probably the one time that Paul raised someone from the dead, and, and Luke wants to make sure we include it so that you can see that he has the same authority. It's not like, well, Paul did all the things Peter did, except he never raised anybody from the dead. No, um, that's uh, why poor Eutychus is falling out of the window is important. Anyway, uh, they're both sent by a vision. They're both miraculously freed from prison. And there's probably some more parallels as well, but those are the main ones. So uh, maybe you could think of Elijah and Elisha, their team ministry, tag team handoff ministry, uh, as similar to that of Peter and Paul. Although Peter and Paul, um, they just go to different people. You know, Peter to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. They sort of split up, whereas uh, Elijah and Elisha was a succession, a passing of the torch, uh, so to speak. Um, here you see a little map of uh, Israel and Judah, and you can see that... Um, other than the time Elijah finds refuge at Mount Horeb, um, which is far south of the southern kingdom of Judah, all of Elijah and Elisha's ministry takes place in the context of the northern kingdom, uh, the ten tribes uh, that are not Judah and Benjamin, which comprise the southern kingdom. And uh, you can see there the various things. Uh, right there north of the Dead Sea, you see a little star. That's where... Uh, Elijah ascends into heaven in a chariot of fire and throws down his mantle to Elisha, sort of passing on the torch to him. By the way, that is also why 
Um, I've heard that pastors uh, wear stoles or have stoles placed on them at ordination. This is not a hard and fast thing. Um, and maybe this justification even happened after the fact. I confess, I don't know the history that well, but I do know that when uh, like poor seminarians preach at Zion, they don't have a stole. Uh, they don't have any place to pin their microphone. And so they have to pin it under their robe or to their robe. It's always kind of an awkward thing. Um, you know, so if nothing else, a stole is good for pinning a microphone too. Although, as you see, Pastor Roland wears the one in the ear and uh, I can't do that. My ears are small. I got little ears. And so that thing flops all over the place. So they got me a, like a little horse harness I wear on Sunday mornings. And um, I didn't much like it at first, but I'm used to it now. If it looks ridiculous, I apologize. Uh, the one good thing about it is it stays right where I need it to. Uh, our AV folks don't like the pin on mics on the stole because if you turn your head away, then the sound fades and that's not good for the live stream. So lo and behold, what are we going to do? Anyway, that's more than you needed to know. But at ordination, I had a stole placed upon me by those pastors present, sort of like, hey, you're in the club now. You're in the prophetic ministry alongside of us. Um, welcome, you know, and it's like they should say, get ready. <laughs> because see, once you're a pastor, what happens is, like it or not, you may be a a chump, but people see you as an authority figure. They don't necessarily respect you as an authority figure like they did 20, 30, 40 years ago where the, where the pastor speaks, and that's sort of the gospel. Um, people are much more skeptical of religious leaders and pastors these days. But nevertheless, for instance, um, if, a, if a family's got some messy business going on in their midst, so to speak, um, and they ask a Christian friend what they think about it. And the Christian friend can sort of be honest with them and offer their opinion. And they'll nod their head and take it into consideration. It may not be what they want to hear, but it's sort of like, ah, well, okay. A person could be sitting in a pastor's office and say the same thing. The pastor offers his counsel and opinion based on God's word. And it can feel like the end of the world for people. Why the difference? Well, um, because this guy supposedly represents God somehow and God's voice. And if he says something I don't want to hear, the the ante is up, so to speak. And so I, I what I found is that that pastors can often raise the temperature in the room when their opinion is asked on controversial issues. Uh, it seems as if even though pastors are not sort of given the implicit authority by society anymore like they used to, it's still um, their word carries weight that causes people to squirm if they don't like what's being said. And so it just is what it is. Um, but I think it's that mantle uh, that's been placed upon us. And uh, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying that's how it is. And uh, I would encourage people um, to be willing to share with a pastor uh, struggles in their life because uh, we've seen a lot of it and uh, you probably won't surprise us. Uh, sin doesn't surprise us. And, and we'll speak God's word faithfully, but we'll also try to speak with compassion and care, knowing that life is, life is messy. Uh, here's kind of the outline of Elijah's ministry. Uh, he's called, um, he had, uh, where it's at in the Bible anyway, he's called in 1 Kings 19. Um, 2 Kings 2 through 9 is where the main bulk of his ministry is going to be found. And then uh, his death, the events of his death are recorded for us in 2 Kings 13. A couple of fun facts about Elijah. His name means my God is salvation. We may think that's profound, but actually it's a common, very common name uh, in that day. By the way, that should say Elisha, not Elijah. Uh, his hometown was uh, Abel Mahola which I don't know how to pronounce, but it was in the territory of Manasseh. We learned that in Judges. Elijah seems to have been doing pretty well for himself when he's called into ministry. Uh, when he's called, he's plowing a large tee of oxen, so he was probably economically prosperous based on that subtle hint alone. Uh, but he also has a religious sensitivity, uh, which is rare among people of means in Scripture or in life today. Uh, the more money you have, the less you need God, the less you seem to care about these things, but uh, he is ready to follow Elijah when Elijah shows up. So, you know, kind of like Martin Luther used to sit in the confessional and worry about his sins all day long. Uh, he was one of those rare people in the history of the world who actually cared about the reality of a sin and serving God. And uh, that's rare. And if that's you, uh, feel proud of that. 
don't take credit for it. Give the Holy Spirit credit, but consider yourself blessed. What titles are given to Elijah? Uh, he's called the prophet several times. Uh, we refer to him as a prophet, obviously. But more often, um, many times, he's referred to as a man of God. Just a man of God. David was a man after God's own heart. Again, there are many prophets in Scripture. That's how we're used to talking about them. Um, but most of all, Elijah's faithful to his God. All right. I love this chart I found. I think it's a nice little chart if you wanted to go back and study Elijah's life. Um, it's a little blurry. I could not find a better resolution. I apologize for that, but I, I think it will still do the trick as just far as kind of walking through the pattern of Elijah's ministry. Again, in uh, 1 Kings 19, I'm in the far left column there. Uh, we have his call. Um, we show that it, he is... Uh, he, he, he's a devoted individual. He was one of the 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal. Um, he, he's dedicated to his occupation. He's not a lazy person. He's out making a living. He's plowing with the oxen, uh, doing hard work and laboring. Um, he's set apart as, as the mantle is cast on him by Elijah at his call. And, and he, he's, he's willing to submit to God's call in his life. And so um, he spends then uh, his, his 10 years uh, with Elijah before um, the mantle is passed officially. Then in 1 Kings 2 through 6, uh, records kind of a cluster of activity that takes place over about 12 years. Um, the beginning of that is uh, his commission. Um, right, he receives a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah departs here. Um, so this is kind of get, getting going, you know, the, the official passing of the mantle. And then uh, the competence he demonstrates as a prophet uh, during years of abundant blessing, uh, his office is confirmed uh, by signs. He heals the waters at Jericho. He, he's mocked at Bethel. He's instructed uh, and provides instruction to Jehoshaphat. Uh, and then he also shows compassion in his service as he cares for uh, impoverished widows, uh, childless Shumanites, uh, raises the dead son, uh, the poison pot, uh, lost axe had some of these uh, familiar stories uh, that you that you hear about uh, Elijah, usually in Sunday school when you're learning about him. This is kind of, you know, the, the bread and butter of his ministry. Uh, and then uh, near the end, it uh, shows more comprehension uh, as a national leader, um, prophesies during the, the war with Syria, uh, the Syrian invasion of Israel, um, et cetera. And then finally, in his death, uh, we see, again, uh, kind of a miraculous thing. But uh, notice the last 45 years of his ministry. Remember, we said his ministry was about five decades. Um, not a lot is is recorded for us uh, other than the events of his death. And so um, kind of like most people hit their sweet spot in midlife. Those are the big years of their career. That's kind of kind of how it seems to be with Elijah, although I don't think his ministry ceased, uh, but this is what's been recorded for us. And we could maybe safely assume that the patterns that he demonstrates in these years, uh, even though uh, the rest of the years aren't recorded for us, that he goes about continuing to minister faithfully. Uh, there's some literary uh, artistry, I guess, in uh, the organization of the Elijah cycle. Um what you see here is kind of what we call a chiasm, that uh, the beginning and the end are similar, uh, and then events on each side of the middle uh, are similar as well. So uh, at its beginning, he's called by Elijah. Um, uh, he's succeeded uh, Elijah. There's a succession that takes place at the end of his ministry. Um, there's war stories that bookend his prophetic ministry. Uh, as he prophesied during the war with Moab and then uh, also prophesied Samaria's release. So these war stories. But then in the middle, in the in the meat of his ministry, notice um, he ministers uh, alternately with accounts between in prophetic company and also in individual ministry. And there's a few things I want to say about that uh, that can kind of keep maybe Elisha distinct from Elijah. Um he worked within a company of prophets that was almost exclusively related to him in the Old Testament. We don't hear of other prophets working uh, in sort of a band of prophets, so to speak. Um, his influence on society, the larger society around him, though, usually occurred through his interaction with kings. 
Scholarly treatments of Elijah's social location have focused on his leadership of the company of prophets. So he was the head of them uh, his, and his political relationship with the various dynasties of the kings during which he ruled. So interestingly, Elijah doesn't, Elisha doesn't always work alone, right? Um, in his individual ministry, then, he's more usually ministering to uh, individuals, like raising the Shumanite son or, or healing healing uh, Nathan. So uh, something that I can say about that, and I, wa I want to say about that, uh, I'll, I'll say later, um, but there's, there's more than just a chiastic narrative structure to Elisha's cycle. Um, Here's some interesting stuff. The figure of Elijah is presented from beginning to end in such a way as to give a discernible impression. Just before Elijah appears on the stage of history, God reveals to Elijah that Elisha may have to wield the sword against Israel. So you kind of get this preparation for his coming. Uh, the first verb associated with Elijah is to kill. But when Elijah places his mantle on Elisha, the latter does not proceed to kill anyone, but rather sacrifices some of his own animals to provide food. The very last verb connected with Elijah is to live, as a corpse that touches Elijah's bones is resurrected. The potential threat of death through Elijah's ministry is countered by the miracle of life, on which the narratives about him both begin and conclude. Um, so there's kind of that interesting paradox here that, that you think maybe Elisha is going to come sort of uh, with a vengeance, just like you thought maybe John the Baptist was, or even Jesus, right? The axe is laid at the root of the trees, and yet his ministry uh, is full of grace and mercy, uh, more so than death and killing. And so just that uh, forerunner of the pattern of Christ, who would come uh, with grace and mercy himself. Uh, here's another a little map of Elijah and Elisha's ministry. Um, and again, what I want to say about these, I think uh, that that is important is this. Um, what is unique about Elisha narratives is the way they occasionally step out of national history to demonstrate that God is active even when Elisha is not challenging or guarding kings. Uh, he would care for not just things at a national level, but individuals. And this was important because the Israelites before and after exile would see in these Elijah stories affirmation that God still cares for a righteous remnant, even while the nation itself suffers. So when, when the southern kingdom of Judah is in exile in Babylon, they would look to these stories of Elisha and they would say, hey, even though we're not a national power right now, even though we don't have a king, see, just how God cared for these individuals uh, uh, through Elisha, he's caring for us now. Even though we are not prominent and royal and official, um, God has his eye on us as well. He has his eye on the, the sparrow, so to speak. Not, not one falls to the ground apart from his will. And so... Um, that's how Elijah's ministry functioned in the future life of Israel. It was a source of great comfort uh, and hope. Again, I'm assuming uh, you touched on some of these stories in your workbook, but just a few of the uh, the more prominent things he does. I'll uh, we'll start at the top. Uh, heals Naaman of leprosy. Um, raises to life the son of a Sh 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 Shunammite woman. Um, leads the Aramean troops from Dotham to Samaria. Uh, prophesies the lifting of the Aramean siege, uh, cures the poisonous stew. And one of the more comical stories in scripture, boys during Elijah are attacked by two bears. You don't mess with a prophet, right? Um, and then, of course, just north of the, the Dead Sea there near Jericho um, is where uh, Elijah makes Elisha his uh, successor. So, again, events in and around um, the northern kingdom. Uh, or what's going on there. All right. Um, so to kind of wrap things up here, I guess, uh, with Elisha, um, I'm going to read you a little something that I found in a commentary that probably could say it better than, than I can. It says this, there can be little doubt that the persons responsible for including the Elisha narratives in Second Kings believe that the prophet carried out a ministry of the kind affirmed by Moses in Deuteronomy. So Moses had probably, there were going to be people coming after him that would carry out these prophetic ministries. Uh, Israelite kings were judged according to their sins against God's law. And so also prophets like Samuel, Nathan, Elijah, and Elisha, they declare God's intentions for judgment and mercy. They call the people to repentance when they need to, and they also pronounce God's mercy. 
mercy. Uh, kings and people needed to respond to their ministry uh, with faith if they were to enjoy that mercy. And for this reason, it's accurate to understand Elijah as a prophet of both judgment as and hope. Although in Elijah's case, this is not as straightforward as it is with some others. Reading between the lines, Elijah has a complex personality um, that sort of provides a very reasonable portrayal, a very human portrayal of these prophets. Uh, he's not a larger-than-life figure, necessarily, despite uh, the dramatic beginnings. Um, he is wrestling with what it means to be God's prophet, just like he kind of wrestled with how to uh, see the kingship in Israel. He didn't want to outright condemn it because it did have some benefits for the people, and yet he knew it wasn't part of God's original plan. So he he wrestles with these things, uh, very pastoral in that respect, and probably pastors can learn a lot uh, by studying Elijah's ministry. Um, for instance, judgment on Ahab's sinful house that he was supposed to claim is postponed. It's never completely dismissed, but it's postponed. There was some pastoral sensitivity there. There was some reluctance to bring a final word of judgment. Uh, in, in, other word, in other places, stories that contain a cause for hope also describe the consequences of failing to trust in a prophet. So even when he wanted to proclaim great hope, it was tempered with the reality that people's hope is fleeting and fading. And so... Um, what you see here is a real complex picture of someone who's trying to stand in God's place and proclaim God's word. And uh, just like real ministry is among real people, um, it's often very difficult to know precisely what God's will is or isn't, um, when to proclaim the law, and when to proclaim the gospel. In fact, Luther said distinguishing law and gospel was the highest art in any ministry. And... Um, I think that's true. How do we know uh, what's going on behind the scenes in people's lives that's causing, uh, fueling their sin? Uh, yes, sin always needs rebuked. Um, but how and when and, and how long do we suffer with people uh, before we call them to account? Similarly, um, we don't uh, proclaim the forgiveness of the gospel until repentance has been demonstrated. And so, uh, people who are smug in their sin, arrogant in their sin, uh, aren't necessarily ready to hear God's forgiving word. That's sort of a, a get off the hook um, word of, of of grace that maybe wouldn't be pronounced by Jesus himself if he could look in that individual's heart and see that they have no intention of turning aside from uh, whatever sin it is they struggle with. And so uh, we see that going on in, in the ministry of Elijah. And again, uh, part of the struggle of any prophetic ministry um, pastoral ministry, or uh, let's not forget, uh, you uh, all are not pastors or prophets, and yet you still have a ministry among your family, friends, and neighbors uh, to speak God's word to them uh, in their lives. And so, um, again, I think that we we learn a lot about pastoral sensitivity from Elijah. All right, well, that's all I had for you today. I hope uh, something or another was gleaned from it. Uh, God's Peace to you as we begin this new year, and I'll see you again before the year's out.